Five, four, three. Ignition. Three, two, one. Zero. Roger. Lift off. 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 This is your Colby Cast, a weekly roundup of news from the ColbyJack.net world headquarters, flavored with a healthy dose of fiction. Push the button! Hey, welcome to ColbyCast 29 for June 29th, 2011. Welcome, welcome. My, does time fly when you're having fun. I got ready to record this intro and realized that we'd passed the six-month point for ColbyCast three weeks ago. Yay, us! Let me see what we have done in the last six months. Since ColbyCast 1, we have presented 29 ColbyCast episodes, 43 episodes of These Are Mine, and 11 episodes of Death of a Shady Dame. Not bad, considering that we started podcasting in November with the NaNoWriMo presentation of The Mouse Queen which clocked in 30 episodes over six weeks. So if we count everything produced in-house, we have presented 29 plus 42 plus 11, which is, um, math is hard, must not shop, uh, uh, the pain, gone! 82 episodes in 29 weeks. If you add in the Mouse Queen... We get, let's see, um, uh, 112 episodes in 33 weeks. All done while trying to figure out what we were doing. So back pats all around. If you've been here since the beginning, I feel for you. No one should have to suffer through that much pain. Seriously, I know, I forget this most weeks, but if you have any questions, comments, have an idea for an author you'd like us to try to get, let us know. (laughs) Heck, if you have your own short story, novella, or novel that you have had published, and yes, self-pubs count here, and you'd like to hear it, drop me a line. Oh, what was that? You do know they can't hear you when you use the intercom. Uh. Oh, True W, the head of groveling here at ColbyCast, wants me to repeat the email address. Oh, I I didn't give it before? Come on, I did it before. Just not this week. Or last week. (sighs) Okay. If you have anything you think we'd like, drop us a line at rlferguson at colbyjack.net. One more time, that's rlferguson at colbyjack.net. Come on, drop us a line, let us know how we're doing. And on top of that, if you got something for us, it'll make us life so much better. Oh, no, no, no. We don't pay for submissions, but we do offer loads of appreciation to anyone who wants their work performed here. So, news of the week. Got some pretty boring stuff here. I uh, recorded all seven chapters of The Night of the Long Knives by Fritz Leiber, mastered about half of The Mouse Queen, and did other not-so-exciting production things. On the home front, as you all remember, we've been learning how to live with a diabetic dog. For those of you just new to our podcast, I have two dogs, Colby Jack, of website fame, and Mary Doe, which is short for Mary. A few weeks ago, Mary Doe was diagnosed with diabetes. Last week, she was refusing to eat. If she doesn't eat, she doesn't get insulin. If she doesn't get insulin, sooner or later, she will slip into a coma and die. (laughs) Good stuff. We got the eating done. Because there were two problems with her eating. First, she was on an antibiotic with a side effect that prevents hunger. (laughs) Yeah, that really helped. The vet determined that it must be one of the issues and took her off that medicine. That helped a lot. Second was G and I. G, my wife, is a recovering food addict, and I just love food. And I have no sense of portions. It turned out that when she did eat, she was getting a full day's food, not a half day's, twice a day. No wonder she didn't want to eat in the evening. We decreased her portion sizes, and she started eating what she should, when she should. Oh, that's much better. She had her glucose test yesterday, which was Tuesday, and she is now within normal ranges. So we are doing great. The only issue we have right now is Mary Doe is getting tired of needles. 
So of course she does fun things, like lie down and show her belly when she sees a needle. Or she moves away. Come on, she even snapped at me yesterday. But I put the kibosh on that by grabbing her muzzle and growling while I shook it, going, Rrr. She got the message. Heck, even Colby Jack has gotten into the avoid the needle business. On Monday, when I went to give her her morning shot, he let out this crazy puppy cry like a Rrr, when he saw the needle. It sounded like, watch out, he's going to stab you. Naturally, Mary bolted after him then and then started playing. It is really annoying. I'm sure I'll pass with time. We just have to survive it. Now, enough about my adventure in dogs. Let's get on to the story. Today, we are presenting part one of seven of The Night of the Long Knives by Fritz Leiber. Hey, I got it right that time. This was a fun recording. It took me a couple of pages to get the narrator down, to be honest. But I think it was worth it. I know that most people, when doing a post-apocalyptic story, will make the characters all depresso and morose. But that just wasn't happening this time. The narrator, Ray, came across as a speed freak, a tweaker, a serious meth head. Sure, he doesn't do drugs, but his words sounded in my head like someone seriously intense. So he is. This guy is a mile a minute with no stop for passengers, and the pace of my reading matched. On a metric of narration speeds, my normal range runs between 135 and 140 words a minute. His tempo forced me up to about 160, and he just wouldn't slow down for anything. The story is a happy tale of murderers finding that there might be a life beyond murder. <laughs> Seriously, fun stuff. Let's do that author stuff right now. Okay, Fritz Leiber was an American science fiction and fantasy author who published between 1939 and his death in 1992. He is best known for his Fayford and Grey Mouser series, which were published between 1970 and 1988. He won numerous awards and is seen as the third father of fantasy by the only person who counts, me, right behind Tolkien and Howard. The Night of the Long Knives originally appeared in Amazing Science Fiction Stories 1960 and is supplied to ColbyJack.net by the fine folks at Project Gutenberg. Now secure your weapons, grab your Geiger counters, and put on your masks, for it is time to follow us to the days of Never When in the lands of Neverwhere, with the first of seven installments of The Night of the Long Knives by Fritz Leiber. The Night of the Long Knives by Fritz Leiber Chapter 1 Any man who saw you, or even heard your footsteps, must be ambushed, stalked, and killed, whether needed for food or not. Otherwise, so long as his strength held out, he would be on your trail. The Twenty-Fifth Hour by Herbert Best I was 100 miles from nowhere, and I mean that literally, when I spotted this girl at the corner of my eye. I'd been keeping an extra lookout because I still expected the other undead booger left over from the murder party at nowhere to be stuck in me. I'd been following a line of high voltage towers all counted over at the same gentlemanly tipsy angle by an old blast from the last wall. I judged the girl was going in the same general direction and was being edged over toward my course by a drift of dust that even at my distance showed dangerous metallic gleams and dark humps that might be dead men or cattle. She looked slim, dark-topped, and on guard. Small like me and like me wearing a scarf loosely around the lower half of her face in the style of the old buckaroos. We didn't wave or turn our heads or give the slightest indication we'd seen each other as our paths slowly converged. But we were intensely, minutely watchful. I knew I was, and she had better be. Overhead the sky was a low dust haze as always. I don't remember what a high sky looks like. Three years ago I think I saw Venus, or it may have been Sirius or Jupiter. 
The hot, smoky light was turning from the amber of midday to the bloody bronze of evening. The line of towers I was following showed the faintest spread in the direction of the canty. They must have been only a few miles from Blast Center. As I passed each one, I could see where the metal on the blast side had been eroded. Vaporized by the original blast, mostly smoothly, but with welts and pushwools where the metal had merely melted and run. I suppose the lines of the towers carried had all been vaporized too, but with the haze I couldn't be sure, though I did see three dark blobs up there that might be vultures perching. From the drift around the foot of the nearest tower, a human skull peered whitely. That is rather unusual. Years later now, you still see more dead bodies with meat on them than skeletons. Intense radiation has killed their bacteria and preserved them indefinitely from decay. Just like the packaged meat in the last advertisements. In fact, such bodies are one of the signs of a really hot drift. You avoid them. The vultures pass up such poisonously hot carrion too. They've learned their lesson. I had some big gas tanks begin to loom up, like deformed battleships and flat tops in a smoke screen. Their prows being the juncture of the natural curve of the off-blast side with the massive concavity of the on-blast side. None of the three other boogers and me had had a too clear an idea of where nowhere had been. Hence in part the name. But I knew in a general way that I was somewhere in the Deathlands between Porter County and Oachita Parish. Probably much nearer the former. It's a real mixed up America we've got these days, you know, with just the faintest trickle of a sense of identity left. Like a guy in the padded cell in the most locked up ward in the whole loony bin. If a time traveler from mid 20th century hopped forward to it across the few intervening years and looked at a map of it, if anybody has a map of it, he'd think that the map had run. That it had got some sort of disease that had swollen a few tiny parts beyond all bounds. Paper tumors. While most of the other parts, the parts he remembered carrying names in such big print and showing such bold colors, had shrunk to nothingness. To the east he'd see Atlantic Highlands and Savannah Fortress. To the west, Walla Walla Territory, Pacific Palisades and Los Alamos. And there he'd see an actual change in the coastline, I'm told where three of the biggest stockpiles of fusionables let go and open Death Valley to the sea. So that Los Alamos is closer to being a port. Essentially, he'd find Porter County and Manteno Asylum surprisingly close together near the Great Lakes. Which I tilted and spilled out a bit toward the southwest with the big quick. South centrally, Oachita Parish inching up the Mississippi from old Louisiana under the cruel urging of the Fisher Sheriffs. Those you'd find in a few, a very few other places, including a couple I suppose I haven't heard of. Practically all of them would surprise him. No one can predict what scraps of a blasted nation are going to hang on to a shred of organization and ruthlessly maintain it and very slowly and very jealously extend it. But biggest of all, occupying practically all the map, Reducing all those swollen localities I've mentioned back to tiny blobs, bounding most of America, and thrusting its jetty pseudopods everywhere, he'd see the great ink blot of the Deathlands. I don't know how else by an area of solid, absolutely unrelieved black you'd represent the Deathlands with its multicolored radioactive dusts and its skimpy frenage of lonely Deathlanders, each bound on his murderous, utterly pointless but utterly absorbing business. An area where names like nowhere, it, anywhere, and the place are the most natural thing in the world. Where a few of us decide to try to pad down together for a few nervous months or weeks. As I say, I was somewhere in the Deathlands near Mantano Asylum. The girl and me were getting closer now. Well within pistol or dart range though beyond any but the most expert or lucky knife throw. She wore boots and a weathered long sleeve shirt and jeans. The black topping was hair, piled high in an elaborate coiffure 
that was held in place by twisted shavings of bright metal. A fine bug trap, I told myself. In her left hand, which was closest to me, she carried a dark gun, pointed away from me across her body. It was the kind of potent tiny crossbow you can't easily tell whether the spring is loaded. Back around on her left hip, a small leather satchel was strapped to her belt. Also, on the same side were two sheathed knives, one of which was an oddity. It had no handle, just the bare tang. For nothing but throwing, I guessed. I let my own left hand drift a little closer to my banker's special in its open holster. Ray Baker's great psychological weapon. Though, who knows, the two thirty-eight cartridges it contained might actually fire. The one I put to the test at nowhere had, and very lucky for me. She seemed to be hiding her right arm from me. Then I spotted the weapon it held, one you don't often see, a stevedore's hook. She was hiding her right hand all right. She had the long sleeve pulled down over it, so just the hook stuck out. I asked myself if the hand were perhaps covered with radiation scars or sores or otherwise disfigured. We Deathlanders have our vanities. I'm sensitive about my baldness. Then she let her right arm swing more freely, and I saw how short it was. She had no right hand. The hook was attached to the wrist stump. I judged she was about ten years younger than me. I'm pushing forty, I think. <laughs> Though some people have judged I'm younger. No way of my knowing for sure. In this life, you forget trifles like chronology. Anyway, the age difference meant she would have quicker reflexes. I'd have to keep that in mind. The greenishly glint and dust drift that I judged she was avoiding swung closer ahead. The girl's left elbow gave a little kick to the satchel on her hip, and there was a sudden burst of irregular ticks that almost made me start. I steadied myself and concentrated on thinking whether I should attach any special significance to her carrying a Geiger counter. Naturally, it wasn't the sort of thinking that interfered in any way with my watchfulness. You quickly lose the habit of that kind of thinking in the Deathlands, or you lose something else. It could mean she was some sort of greenhorn. Most of us old-timers can visually judge the heat of a dust drift, or crater, or raid area more reliably than any instrument. Some burgers claim they just feel it. Though I've never known any of the latter too eager to navigate an unfamiliar country at night. What you think they'd be willing to do if they could feel heat blind? But she didn't look one bit like a tenderfoot. Like, for instance, some citizeness newly banished from Mantino. Or like some porter booger's unfaithful wife or troublesome girlfriend who'd he'd personally carted out beyond the ridges of cleared out hot dust that helped guard such places, and then abandoned in revenge or from boredom. And they call themselves civilized, those cultural queers. No, she looked like she belonged in the Deathlands. But then why the counter? Her eyes might be bad, real bad. I didn't think so. She raised her boot an extra inch to step over a little jagged fragment of concrete. No. Maybe she's just a born double checker using science to back up knowledge based on experience as rich as my own or richer. I'd met the super careful type before. They mostly get along pretty well, but they tend to be a shade too slow in the clutches. Maybe she was testing the counter, planning to use it some other way or trade it for something. Maybe she made a practice of traveling by night. Then the counter made good sense. But then why use it by day? Why reveal it to me in any case? Was she trying to convince me that she was a greenhorn? Or had she hoped that the sudden noise would throw me off guard? But who would go to the trouble of carrying a Geiger counter for such devious purposes? And wouldn't she have waited until we got closer before trying the noise gambit? Thanks, Schmink. It gets you nowhere. She kicked off the counter with another bump of her elbow and started to edge in toward me faster. 
I turned the think it all off and gave my whole mind to watchfulness. Soon we were barely more than eight feet apart, almost within lunging range without the, even the preliminary one-two step, and still we hadn't spoken or looked straight at each other. Though being that close, we'd had to cant our heads around a bit to keep each other in peripheral vision. Our eyes would be on each other steadily for five or six seconds, then dart forward an instant to check for rocks and holes in the trail we were following in parallel. A cultural queer from one of the civilized places would have found it funny, I suppose. If he'd been able to watch us perform in an arena or from behind armored glass for his exclusive pleasure. The girl had eyebrows as black as her hair, which in its piled up and metal knotted savagery called to mind African queens, despite her typical pale complexion. Very little ultraviolet gets through the dust. From the inside corner of her right eye socket, a narrow radiation scar ran up between her eyebrows and across her forehead at a rakish angle until it disappeared under a sweep of hair at the upper left corner of her forehead. I'd been smelling her, of course, for some time. I could even tell the color of her eyes now. They were blue. It's a color you never see. Almost no dust have a bluish cast. There are few blue objects except certain dark steels. The sun never gets very far away from the orange range. Though it is green from time to time, and water reflects the sky. Yes, she had blue eyes. Blue eyes and that jaunty scar. Blue eyes and that jaunty scar and a dark gun and a steel hook for a right hand. And we were walking side by side, eight feet apart, not an inch closer. Still not looking straight at each other. Still not saying a word. And I realized that the initial period of unadulterated watchfulness was over. That I'd had adequate opportunity to inspect this girl and size her up. And that night was coming on fast. And that here I was. Once again, back with the problem of the two urges. I could either try to kill her or go to bed with her. I knew that at this point, the cultural queers, and certainly our imaginary time traveler from the mid-20th century, would make a great noise about not understanding and not believing in the genuineness of the simple urge to murder that governs the lives of us Deathlanders. Like detective store pundits, they would say that a man or woman murders for gain, for concealment of crime, or from throttled sexual desire, or outraged sexual possessiveness. And maybe they would list a few other rational motives. But not, they would say, just for the simple sake of murder. For the sure release and relief it gives. For the sake of wiping out one recognizable bit more. The closest bit we can, since those of us with the courage or lazy rationality to wipe out ourselves have long since done so. Wiping out one recognizable bit more of the whole miserable, utterly disgusting human mess. Unless, they say, a person is completely insane, which is actually how all outsiders view us Deathlanders. They can think of us in no other way. I guess cultural queers and time travelers simply don't understand. Though, to be so blind, it seems to me that they have to overlook much of the history of the last war and of the subsequent years, especially the mushrooming of crackpot cults with a murder tinge. The werewolf gangs, the berserkers, and the muckers. The revival of Shiva worship and the black mass. The machine wreckers, the kill the killers movements. The new witchcraft, the unholy creepers, the unconsciousers, the radioactive blue gods and rocket devils of the Adamites, and a dozen other groupings clearly prefiguring Deathlander psychology. Those cults had all been as unpredictable as Thudgy, or the dancing madness of the Middle Ages, or the Children's Crusade. Yet they had happened just the same. But cultural queers are good at overlooking things. They have to be, I suppose. They think their humanity growing again. Yes, despite their laughable warpedness and hysterical crippledness, they actually believe each howlingly different community of them, that they're the new Adams and Eves. 
They're all excited about themselves and whether or not they wear fig leaves. They don't carry with them 24 hours a day like us Deathlanders do. The burden of all that was forever lost. Since I've gone this far, I'll go a bit further and make the paradoxical admission that even us Deathlanders don't really understand our urge to murder. Oh, we have our rationalizations of it, just like everyone has of his ruling passion. We call ourselves junk men, scavengers, gangrene surgeons. We sometimes believe we're doing the person we kill the ultimate kindness. Yes, and get slobberly tearful about it afterwards. We sometimes tell ourselves we finally found and are rubbing out the one man or woman who is responsible for everything. We talk, mostly to ourselves, about the aesthetics of homicide. We occasionally admit, but only each to himself alone, that we're just plain nuts. But we don't really understand our urge to murder. We only feel it. At the hateful sight of another human being, we feel it begins to grow in us until it becomes an overpowering impulse that jerks us. Like a puppet is jerked by its strings into the act itself, or its attempted commission. Like I was feeling it grow in me now, as we did this parallel death march through the reddening haze, me and this girl and our problem. The girl with the blue eyes and the jaunty scar. The problem of the two urges, I said. The other urge, the sexual is one I know all cultural queers, and certainly our time traveler, would claim to know all about. Maybe they do. But I wonder if they understand how intense it can be with us Deathlanders, when it's the only release. Except maybe liquor and drugs, which we seldom can get, and even more rarely dare use. The only complete release, even though a brief one, from the overpowering loneliness and from the tyranny of the urge to kill. To embrace, to possess, to glut lust on. Yes, even briefly to love, briefly to shelter in. That was good. That was a relief and release to be treasured. But it couldn't last. You could draw it out, prop it up perhaps for a few days, for a month even. Though sometimes not for a single night. You might even start to talk to each other a little, after a while, but it could never last. The glands always tire, if nothing else. Murder was the only final solution, the only permanent release. Only us Deathlanders know how good it feels. But then after the kill, the loneliness would come back, redoubled, and after a while I'd meet another hateful human. Our problem of the two urges, as I watched this girl slogging along parallel to me, as I kept constant watch on her, of course, I wondered how she was feeling the two urges. Was she attracted to the ridgy scars on my cheeks, half revealed by my scarf? To me, they have a pleasing symmetry. Was she wondering how my head and face looked without the black felt skull cap low visored over my eyes? Or was she thinking mostly of that hook swinging into my throat under the chin and dragging me down? I couldn't tell. She looked as poker-faced as I was trying to. For that matter, I asked myself, how was I feeling the two urges? How was I feeling them as I watched this girl with the blue eyes and the jaunty scar and the arrogantly thinned lips that asked to be smashed and the slender throat? And I realized that there was no way to describe that, not even to myself. I could only feel the two urges growing me side by side, like monstrous twins, until they would simply be too big for my taut body, and one of them would have to get out fast. I don't know which one of us started to slow down first. It happened so gradually. But the dust puffs that rise from the ground of the Deathlands, even under the lightest treading, became smaller and smaller around our steps and finally vanished altogether and we were standing still. Only then did I notice the obvious physical trigger for our stopping. An old 
small freeway ran at right angles across our path. The shoulder by which we'd approached it was sharply eroded, so that the pavement, which even had a shallow cave eroded under it, was a good three feet above the level of our path, forming a low wall. From where I'd stopped, I could almost reach out and touch the rough-edged, smooth-topped concrete. So could she. We're right in the midst of the gas tanks now, six or seven of them towering around us, squeezed like beer cans by the decade-old blast, but they're metal-looking sound enough until you became aware of the red light showing through at odd patterns of dots and dashes, where vaporization or later erosion had been complete. Almost, but not quite lacework. Just ahead of us, right across the freeway, was the six-story skeletal structure of an old cracking plant, sagging like the power towers away from the blast and the lower stories drifted with piles and ridges and smooth goblets of dust. The light was getting redder and smokier every minute. With the cessation of the physical movement of walking, which is always some sort of release for emotions, I could feel the twin urges growing faster in me. But that was all right, I told myself. This was the crisis, as she must realize too. And that should key us up to bear the urges a little longer without explosion. I was the first to start to turn my head. For the first time, I looked straight into her eyes and she into mine. And as always happens at such times, a third urge appeared abruptly. An urge momentarily as strong as the other two. The urge to speak. To tell and ask all about it. But even as I started to phrase the first crazily happy greeting, my throat lumped. As I had known it would, with the awful melancholy of all that was forever lost. With the uselessness of any communication. And the impossibility of recreating the past. Our individual pasts. Any past. And as it always does, the third urge died. I could tell she was feeling that ultimate pain just like me. I could see her eyelids squeeze down her eyes and her face lift and her shoulders go back as she swallowed hard. She was the first to start to lay aside a weapon. She took two sideways steps toward the freeway and reached her whole left arm further across her body and laid the dark gun on the concrete and drew back her hand from it about six inches. At the same time, looking at me hard, fiercely hard, you'd say, across her left shoulder. She had the experienced duelist trick of seeming to look into my eyes, but actually focusing on my mouth. I was using the same gimmick myself. It's tiring to look straight into another person's eyes, and it could put you off guard. My left side was nearest the wall, so I didn't for the moment have the problem of reaching across my body. I took the same sideways steps she had, and using just two fingers, very gingerly, disarmingly, I hoped, I lifted my antique firearm from its holster and laid it on the concrete and drew back my hand from it all the way. Now it was up to her again, or should be. Her hook was going to be quite a problem, I realized, but we needn't come to it right away. She temporized by successfully unsheathing the two knives at her left side and laying them beside the dark gun. Then she stopped, and her look told me plainly that it was up to me. Now I'm a bugger who believes in carrying one perfect knife. Otherwise, I know for a fact you'll go knife happy and end up by weighing yourself down with dozens, literally. So I'm naturally very reluctant to get out of touch in any way with Mother, who is a little rusty along the sides, but made of the toughest and most sharpenable alloy steel I've ever run across. Still, I was most curious to find out what she'd do about that hook. So I finally laid Mother on the concrete besides the 38 and rested my hands lightly on my hips, all ready to enjoy myself. At least I hoped I gave that impression. She smiled, 
It was almost a nice smile. But now we let our scarves drop since we weren't raising any more dust. And then she took hold of the hook with her left hand and started to unscrew it from the leather and metal base fitting over her stump. Of course, I told myself. And her second knife, the one without a grip, must be that way so she could screw its tang into the base when she wanted a knife on her right hand instead of a hook. I ought to have guessed. I grinned my admiration of her mechanical ingenuity and immediately unhitched my knapsack and laid it beside my weapons. Then a thought occurred to me. I opened the knapsack and moving my hand slowly and very openly so she'd have no reason to suspect her ruse. I drew out a blanket and trying to show her both sides of it in the process as if I were performing some damned conjuring trick dropped it gently on the ground between us. She unsnapped the straps of her satchel that fastened it to her belt and laid it aside. And then she took off her belt too, slowly drawing it through the wide loops of weathered denim. Then she looked meaningfully at my belt. <laughs> I had to agree with her. Belts, especially heavy buckled ones like ours, can be nasty weapons. I removed mine. Simultaneously, each belt joined its corresponding pile of weapons and other belongings. She shook her head, nodded any sort of negation, and ran her fingers into the black hair at several points to show me it hid no weapons. Then looked at me questioningly. I nodded that I was satisfied. I hadn't seen anything run out of it, by the way. Then she looked up at my black skull cap and she raised her eyebrows and smiled again. This time with a spice of mocking anticipation. In some ways I hate to part with that headpiece more than I do with mother. Not really because of its sandwich lead mesh inner lining. If the rays haven't baked my brain yet, they never will. And I'm sure that the patches of lead mesh sewed into my pants over my loins give a lot more practical protection. But I was getting real attracted to this girl by now, and there are times when a person must make a sacrifice of his vanity. I whooped off my stylish black felt and tossed it on my pile and dared her to laugh at my shiny egg top. Strangely, she didn't even smile. She parted her lips and ran her tongue along the upper one. I gave an eager grin in reply, an incautiously wide one, and she saw my plates flash. My plates are something rather special, though they are by no means unique. Back toward the end of the last war, when it was obvious to any realist how bad things were going to be, though not how strangely terrible, a number of people like myself had all their teeth jerked and replaced with durable plates. I went some of them one better. My plates were stainless steel biting and chewing ridges, smooth continuous ones that didn't attempt to copy individual teeth. A person who looks closely at a slab of chewing tobacco, say, I offer him, will be puzzled by the smoothly curved incision, made as if by a razor blade mounted on the arm of a compass. Magnetic powder Buried in my gums makes for a real nice fit. This sacrifice was worse than my hat and mother combined, but I could see the girl expected me to make it and would take no substitutes. And in this attitude I had to admit that she showed very sound judgment, because I keep the incisor parts of those plates filed to razor sharpness. I have to be careful about my tongue and lips, but I figure it's worth it. With my dental scimitars, I can't in a wink bite out a chunk of throat and windpipe or juggler, though I've never had an occasion to do so yet. For the first time, it made me feel like an old man, a real daughterer. But by now, the attraction this girl had for me was getting irrational. I carefully laid the two plates on top of my knapsack. In return, as a sort of reward, you might say, she opened her mouth wide and showed me what was left of her own teeth, about two-thirds of them, 
a patchwork of tartar and gold. We took off our boots, pants, and shirts. She watched very suspiciously. I knew she'd been skeptical of my carrying only one knife. Oddly, perhaps, considering how touchy I am about my baldness, I felt no sensitivity about revealing the lack of hair on my chest, and in fact a sort of pride in displaying the slanting radiation scars that have replaced it. Though they are crawling keloids of the ugliest, bumpiest sort. I guess to me such scars are tribal insignia. One man and one woman tribes, of course. No question, but that the scar on the girl's forehead had been the first focus of my desire for her. And it still added to my interest. By now we weren't staying as perfectly on guard or watching each other's clothing for concealed weapons as carefully as we should. I know I wasn't. It was getting dark fast. There wasn't much time left. And the other interest was simply becoming too great. We were still automatically careful about how we did things. For instance, the way we took off our pants was like ballet, simultaneously crouching a little on the left foot and whipping the right leg out of its sheath in one movement, all ready to jump without tripping ourselves if the other person did anything funny, and then skidding down the left pant leg with a movement almost as swift. But as I say, it was getting too late for perfect watchfulness. In fact, for any kind of effective watchfulness at all, the complexion of the whole situation was changing in a rush. The possibilities of dealing or receiving death, along with the chance of the minor indignity of cannibalism, which some of us practice, were suddenly gone, all gone. It was going to be all right this time, I was telling myself. This was the time it would be different. This was the time love would last. This was the time lust would be the firm foundation for understanding and trust. This time there would be really safe sleeping. This girl's body would be home for me. A beautiful, tender, inexhaustibly exciting home. And mine for her. For always. As she threw off her shirt. The last darkly red light showed me another smooth, slant-wise sky. This one around her hips. Like a narrow girdle that has slipped down a little on one side. This has been a Colby Cast episode. This work is distributed under a Creative Commons, attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. Share it, link it, blog it, talk about it. As Woody Guthrie said, this song is copyrighted in the U.S. under seal of copyright number 154085 for a period of 28 years. And anybody caught singing it without our permission will be a mighty good friend to Arn because we don't give a gurn. Publish it, write it, sing it, swing to it, yodel it. We wrote it, that's all we wanted to do.